Welcome back to World Health Plus Social Good. It's Friday at the World Health Assembly in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm Christy Feig, the Director of Communications at the World Health Organization. You know, it dawned on me, before we jump into this show today, uh, you haven't really seen much more of the World Health Assembly than this particular studio. Uh, so I thought maybe we should uh, work a little bit and show you some of the context around here, uh, get you out and about just a little bit. Gilles Ribot, one of our photographers here on the show, has taken the time to cut together some video uh, so that you can see some of the things that have been going on throughout the assembly. Let's take a look around. All right, first, this is the Palais des Nations. This is where the UN is headquartered here in Geneva, Switzerland. We come down here for the World Health Assembly because we have too many people to do it up the hill. There you see our flag, the blue flag of the UN with our symbol on top of it. This is the big assembly hall. This is where many of the big events start, the speech of the director general, the keynote address, for example. You see it's got a big floor and two balconies. I don't know how many people this room can hold, but there are 3,300 delegates here from our member states, plus a lot of media and NGOs. This particular video is from the Director General's speech earlier this week, and it's probably the time that it was the fullest. This here is the President, the Minister of Health in Cuba, and he's introducing the Director General to give her keynote address, and there she is right there. Let's listen to her. We learned that health is a smart investment. It brings measurable results, sometimes remarkable results. In fact, last year's Lancet Commission on investing in health shows that the returns on health investments are even higher than previously calculated. We learned that markets cannot sell something to people who cannot pay. Childhood immunization programs deliver vaccines at no cost to recipients. The massive free distribution of bed nets coincide with the dramatic drops in malaria cases and deaths. The bottom billion receive medicines for neglected tropical diseases at no cost. Universal health coverage goes hand in hand with financial risk protection, especially for the poor. But we also learned that Policies matters as much as money. Now the big assembly hall is only where part of the action is. Committee A, Committee B, side events, technical briefings, all means a lot of commotion in the hallway. There's some of our exhibits there. Uh, so you can see where the different booths are set up. So there's the Palais de Nation. It's really set, not in a big bustling city like you think it might be, but the countryside around Geneva. There you go. I know you're still in your moment of zen there with the mountains around you, the lake, Geneva, but I'm going to jar you back to reality here because Committee A and Committee B are still in full swing, so there's a lot to talk about. Just wanted you to see some of the goings-ons around here during the week. Committee A is taking up some major issues today, disability, autism, psoriasis. The newborn action plan that we discussed earlier this week will also come up uh, today or tonight in Committee A. Committee B is working on health system issues like access to essential medicines, palliative care, and strengthening regulatory systems, all to improve health. Uh, today we will go in this session here beyond some of the hot issues of the assembly, uh, look more to some of the trends in health that we're seeing these days, talking about nutrition, indoor air pollution, climate and health, and how communications technology is working to improve health. But first, let's get checked in with Sari Setiogi and our social media team to find out what some of the issues are on social media today. Sorry, Committee A and Committee B are in full force and things are moving fast and that means that your team uh, is moving quite fast. Tell me about what's going on today on social media. Absolutely, I think um, as we're coming nearly towards the end of uh, the health assembly, I think everyone is on fire, including those people who are tweeting. As of this morning, uh, Committee A, uh, they've, appro uh, they've um, uh, approved a resolution on disability. Um, we saw a lot of uh, pickup, a lot of positive pickup on social media, uh, and also um, resolution on um, autism that was also picked up uh, positively by many. And just now, as I came here, the resolution on uh, psoriasis was 
also approve. And then moving to committee B, uh, they also has approved the resolution on uh, traditional medicine. Uh, and that was also welcomed positively on social media. What are some of the other issues on social media today that people are really engaging in? Yeah, um, aside from the approved resolution I mentioned earlier, um, there is a sideline events on adolescent health that was uh, organized by the IFPMA. And that drew uh, a lot of attention from our young uh, participants, um, medical students, interns. Um, they're really tweeting away from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. How popular would you say on social media that the World Health Assembly is? I mean, I know there's all kinds of things going on in the world today, but how popular is it? Do people care? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's very fascinating. Yesterday I mentioned um, the number of tweets uh, that were using hashtag uh, WH67. It was about uh, 31,800. And by this afternoon, it has reached 38,000. Wow. Yeah. That is about 280 tweets per hour on average. Um, and the number of um, uh, people who uh, are tweeting, um, it's increased by 1,000 compared to yesterday. So now we're over 10,000 people tweeting uh, using hashtag WH67. And I can tell that uh, the hashtag has gained momentum because uh, I noticed that there are some people who are actually trying to join the hashtag, um, spamming it, selling sunglasses and face cream. <laughs> so you know so you've must arrived? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> when people spam you, you know you've arrived. <laughs> exactly. And I also still saw some people who are tweeting about uh, wanting to see DG on roller skates, uh -huh. moving from one room to another. <laughs> but I haven't seen hashtag DG roller skates, though. We'll have to get a DG helmet, <laughs> DG uh, wrist braces. Make sure <laughs> that safety first. <laughs> Uh, last question for you. It's, it, it is our last day uh, to check in with you this week. Uh, yeah. You've been doing some very interesting uh, introductions, I guess we should say, behind the scenes with the people who actually make this event happen. Who have you met today? Yeah, it's actually feeling a little sad for our team because we really enjoy talking to these people, meeting them, knowing them better. Um, but yeah, and also uh, reading uh, from the comments that came in, I think our followers enjoy them too. Um, so today, we have Jean-Claude, who is looking very friendly, but he's actually our security guard, and he has eyes like Superman. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> he can see through doors? <laughs> Um, but when he enters a room, he sees things differently. He, he um, looks for suspicious items, and he said that's in his DNA. Right. And um, this is Pascal. He's our, uh, she's our travel assistant, and I bet you anything, uh, nobody else in this health assembly would, can beat her in a pub quiz about capital cities. <laughs> name any country and she will be able to name the capital city in a flash. And I think that's, that's the perk for uh, handling travel I at the assembly for 20 years. That's amazing. That's amazing dedication indeed. And this is the one that I think we are all curious about. This is me here. He's our barista in one of the coffee shops here at the Palais. We actually ask how many cup of coffees that going around during the assembly, but he said he ran out. He, he, he can't tell. He lost count. He lost count <laughs> on it. Um, but he said that caffeine keeps the assembly running. We need to ask him of all the different health areas uh, on the agenda, which one takes the most caffeine? Yeah, <laughs> probably we should follow up. We should ask him that follow up question, but he definitely can tell. He can understand coffee in many different languages. <laughs> And because this is the last social good, um, we have an extra person. This is Monsieur Peacock. I love it. Find out, yeah, me too. Find out why and who is he. You can check him on our Facebook page and our Instagram. Find out who he is and why we include him as person of Health Assembly. 
you know, it's something that we didn't tell them in the, uh, you know, the video we just did to show them around uh, the Palais grounds uh, was that there are peacocks here. Yes. All right, There's so you get the background, right? On social yes. media, why we have those? Okay, you'll have to go to the social media platforms to find out why there are peacocks at the UM Palais. They are definitely one of the most beautiful things here on the ground. Uh, there's probably five, six, how many would you say? Um, we saw two so far, we but uh, surely there are more. Yeah, it's a, lot, yeah. It's, a it's a big ground here. Sorry, Absolutely. thank you so much. And as she mentioned, uh, uh, she will continue covering uh, the World Health Assembly as it goes on through the night tonight. Hopefully we'll do be done about nine o'clock tonight. Then we'll start up again in the morning uh, and go until we complete our work tomorrow night. But we will not have a World Health Plus Social Good tomorrow, so you'll have to follow with Sari in order to keep up with everything. Sari, thank you for coming by and visiting us this week. Thank it's you. Been great. Now, one of the biggest aspects uh, in public health that is discussed here, it's discussed in many different platforms uh, these days, is nutrition. It's essential to health and development. Better nutrition is obviously linked to improve infant, child, and maternal health, stronger immune systems, safer pregnancies and childbirths, lower risk of diseases like diabetes and heart disease. Healthy children learn better, and people who are healthy make a better community. The flip side of that, malnutrition in every form presents significant health uh, threats to human health. Joining me now to discuss the vital role that nutrition is is Dr. Francesco Branca, the Director of Nutrition and Health Development uh, for WHO, and Davina Nabire from World Vision Uganda. Thank you both for joining us. That will be your microphone. And Francesco, I will start with you. Uh, often when we think about nutritional issues, our minds go straight to acute malnutrition, uh, I think. Uh, however, over the last 10 years, the situation has been much more complex. Can you talk me through that? Yeah, you're right. Uh, we have uh, had this idea of uh, malnutrition being hunger. And we still have uh, uh, about a billion people, in fact, 842 million people who perhaps do not have enough to eat. And we still have uh, 162 million which do not grow to their full potential. But now we are seeing more and more the emergence of the epidemic of uh, overweight and obesity, which is starting from very early in life. And we have about 44 million under five who have these conditions, and they are placed all over the world. In fact, we have more and more of those kids with this problem in low and middle income countries in Africa. It's growing extremely quickly. And then we have the burden of uh, uh, vitamin and mineral deficiency, which affects uh, huge numbers. We calculate over two billion people have micronutrient deficiencies. Just in, to, to look at women, for example, women in reproductive age, we have half a billion people with anemia, and this is related to poor reproductive performance and to, uh, to higher mortality and morbidity. I think a lot of times people don't think of overweight and obesity as, as nutrition issues. Uh, I think that catches people off guard sometimes when they hear about that. Uh, later this year, uh, WHO and FAO will co-host the second international conference on nutrition. Tell me about that conference. What is the goal of it? Why is it so important? We had a first uh, international conference on nutrition 22 years ago. And since then, a lot has changed in the way we produce, manufacture, and distribute food. So we don't eat what we, we sometimes produce, or so we don't eat uh, what we cook at home, but we eat more and more manufactured food. And that's, that has determined a shift in, in the quality of our diet, and sometimes not for the better. We certainly have more vitamin and, and minerals, we have more animal source food in our diets, uh, but we also have too much sugar, too much fat, too much salt. So, so we need to correct that because the driver of the food system have, have not been uh, health and nutrition, but have been sometimes profit. Mm -hmm. So the Conference of Nutrition will try to uh, be a, a, an opportunity for policymakers as a high level event with ministers of health and agriculture who would sit together and in the same room think of the way to correct it, producing a political declaration with commitments and uh, advocating for uh, a decade of actions to put this right. So we have a great expectation from this conference and uh, we hope that uh, then the, the whole set of policies and investments around the food system might be reshaped for the improvement of nutrition globally. 
Undernutrition contributes to a third of deaths in children under five. Uh, yet it's not always included, I think, in, in the health sector when we look at things like the Millennium Development Goals and, and planning ahead for the next 15 years. Uh, why is that and what is being done to try to incorporate it more? Yeah, unfortunately, from the health point of view, we have to deal with the consequences of poor nutrition. But we, we want to have, first of all, a good diet. We want to make sure that uh, all people, and particularly the vulnerable people, the women, the children, have nutritious food. That's number one. And, and as we said, this is really depending on agriculture trade. But then we want to make sure that also the environment is such that uh, uh, children are not uh, challenged, for example, by, by having poor water, poor sanitation, that will determine uh, diseases then will, uh, will then produce a, a poor nutritional status. And then we have all the care aspects. We have the need to have social protection for uh, women to have enough time to be with their children and feed them, for example. So, and then we have the education. We need to have schools where we have good food, but also where we had good concepts about nutrition uh, disseminated to children. So this is genuinely a multi-sectoral issue. It is challenging because, as we said, there are so many drivers uh, uh, in, that not necessarily go in the same direction. So we would like to see more alignment there. Uh, what we're doing is to, first of all, we're trying to explain what these connections are. We're trying to engage with the different sectors and, and somehow health as uh, the leading role to be the convener for these different sectors to address nutrition. And, and then we're trying to uh, make sure that uh, the right effective actions are in place. We know what to do. We simply have to do it, and we, we have to do it at scale. You've done a wonderful job of showing how the nutrition issues thread across uh, the different areas of public health. Talk about for me before I let you go, talk uh, about some of the nutrition uh, things that have happened here at the World Health Assembly this week. I, it was a, was a very interesting uh, year and discussion at the Assembly. We had uh, uh, 45 member states uh, and 10 NGOs taking the floor, so that tells you a whole afternoon yeah. was going there. We had the, the two director generals of FAO and WHO uh, addressing uh, the Assembly. Uh, so it is, a, it is an important topic and the discussion was certainly on the International Conference of Nutrition but also on very delicate topic. One topic was uh, the, um, the situation and the environment of, of uh, food for children and whether there are appropriate or inappropriate practices to market food which is addressed to, to young children. And uh, we'll have to work still on it. We'll have to come with recommendations there. There is, of course, uh, also a concern that there might be conflicts of interest in the whole handling of nutrition issues with, mm -hmm. with, with, with uh, um, uh, profit uh, being in the way of health. So the Assembly requested WHO to look into that and to develop some you know, risk assessment and management tools to deal with that. And then finally, uh, there was a discussion about monitoring the situation and having uh, a global monitoring framework for nutrition to be able to address uh, this and have an accountability framework to address these issues. Okay, let me move to Davina here. Uh, Davina, give us a sense of the impact of nutrition, either good or poor nutrition, uh, where you work in Uganda. Thank you very much. Of course, there is good and bad nutrition, mm -hmm. but for this forum, I'll just uh, stick to the bad nutrition. Okay. Uh, just like Dr. painted a picture of Africa, Uganda is not exceptional. We are seeing 33% of our children under the age of five being uh, wasted, and 14% of these are actually um, stunted. Sorry, it's the mm -hmm. other way around, stunted and then wasted. And then when you talk about malnutrition, we also have to include women of reproductive age. 24% of our women in this age group uh, suffer anemia and um, when you look at the way things are in Africa it is also affecting uh, our economy Uganda has to spend 5.6 percent of its GDP annually on treating malnutrition cases which is really wow. high for us wow. yeah well, what is civil society doing at a community level to help improve that 
Well, I work for World Vision Uganda, and World Vision Uganda is part of the civil society. Mm -hmm. We have uh, nutrition models that we are using to intervene at community level. I'll start with what we call the positive deviance health, which is um, a, a community-led intervention where mothers are sensitized on how to prepare locally available foodstuffs in their community, and after they have learned how to do this, they're able to feed those foods to, the, to their babies. And we have some kind of a rehabilitation program, which takes between 12 to 24 days, depending on how uh, severely affected your child is. And we do not only stop at that. We also do a lot of local level advocacy, and we have what we call the citizen voice and action, which is just dialogue between the citizens and the service providers, who is the government here. Citizens are empowered to demand for the right services. If a mother does not know where to take her baby who is malnourished, then the government is doing something wrong. But if we see empowered citizens going out there and asking for the right services and asking for the right policies, then we're able to see change in the community. I was just going to ask you, how do you work with the governments <laughs> yes. uh, in order to engage in the same way? Anything else you want to add to that? Because you touched on it quite well there at the end. Okay. Okay. So uh, World Vision Uganda uh, is working on a campaign, uh, implementing a Child Health Now campaign, which is aimed at reducing maternal mortality and uh, yeah, and child deaths basically, and we are focusing on under five. And one of the underlying causes of deaths in Uganda is malnutrition. So through this campaign, you're working with policymakers and making sure that nutrition is tabled as priority in each and everything that they are doing. But World Vision Uganda alone cannot kick nutrition out of the country, malnutrition out of the country. So we are working in, under the Sun Movement, under coalition, to first of all bring CSOs together in, and, and we're speaking on one voice harmonized uh, platform and making sure that we have the right policies and they're being implemented. Uh, one of the successes of this is we have now the Uganda National Nutrition Action Plan, the UNAP, which was launched by the government and it's, it's a commitment from the government but you're also pushing and working with members of parliament to make sure that it is implemented otherwise we're not doing enough. Okay. Yeah. Francesco saw this yellow sign get passed up here. This means that one of our viewers has asked a question online and they write it out and pass it up here. And we encourage our viewers to do this. Uh, the question, Francesco, if I can put it to you, mm -hmm. uh, what are you doing to integrate WASH, so water and sanitation, uh, into nutrition? Well, first of all, we are trying to explain what the connections are. And uh, of course, uh, these connections are particularly for for um, Davina was also saying it's stunting. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. children don't grow and don't grow because uh, they get infections and, and they get poor absorption of nutrients and uh, poor water, which is leading to having more diarrhea, poor sanitation, which is uh, leading to having parasites, yeah. for example. Yeah. That is absolutely connected. We're explaining those connections. We're making sure that in nutrition programs, whenever country wants to address these conditions, such as stunting, these elements are clearly there. And, uh, and that uh, all those children who are uh, uh, at risk of stunting are living in an environment uh, which is uh, better from the point of view of water and sanitation. Thank you both very much for coming by. Uh, nutrition will be uh, an area of continued discussion uh, throughout the summer going into the conference that Francesco yeah. mentioned there. Uh, it's the second international conference on nutrition ICN2 is how it's often shorthanded. Uh, it will be held in Rome from the 19th to the 21st of November this year. So you can keep up with the latest developments in nutrition on our social media platforms. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit to indoor air pollution. This is for you, Maria. Around 3 billion people cook and heat their homes with solid fuels like wood and charcoal and coal on open fires or traditional stoves. In the process of trying to heat their homes and cook, it also produces indoor air pollution. Joining me now to talk about the health impacts of these practices and what's being done about it, Dr. Maria Nera, Director of Public Health and Environment for WHO, and Dr. Solomon Mpoke, Director of the Kenyan Medical Research Institute. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Maria, let me start with you. What causes household air pollution and why is it so dangerous, I guess especially for women? Chris, imagine you are at home, not on a very rich country and not on a very rich home either, and you need to use solid fuels to cook and to heat your house. What is going to happen is that you use an open fire for that, and then the result of that combustion is particulates in your air there you are going to breathe, and this is going to your lungs and then obviously causing a lot of damage for your health. 
So in fact, we have the new figures that tell us that more than 4.3 million premature deaths can be associated to this exposure to this household air pollution. And it's affecting more women. Why? Because they are the ones that are staying at home. They are the ones cooking. And normally, they are the ones having their children in their back. And therefore, those little children are the ones ah. more affected. So in fact, they are trapped on that. And sometimes there is even bad ventilation in, in, in house, uh, indoor level, and therefore you are breathing air that is contributing to these horrible causes of disease that I was describing. That number is shocking. Did it surprise you to see that? We knew that the number was very, very high. Mm -hmm. Honestly, on the latest report, we realized that even it was even higher than what we were expecting. And even what we discovered with the latest report is that before we, were, we knew that the diseases associated or, or uh, uh, related, the death caused by indoor air pollution was particularly on diseases more on the respiratory tract. Now we know that it's as well, those diseases are as well ischemic heart, uh, ischemic heart diseases, cardiovascular diseases in general, so stroke, and in addition to that, obviously, the, the, the asthma, uh, all the chronic respiratory diseases, and lung cancer as well. But, you know, the, the damage is absolutely terrible, and, and women are most affected because of this uh, particular exposure. All right, let's talk about some solutions here. What can be done to limit uh, the amount of pollution indoors? Well, the best one will be to have access to a clean source of energy for cooking. That is, is the more logical one, and WHO is trying to promote this idea that energy, women's and health are very much linked. Obviously, it's not only the health of, of women, it's the health of everyone. And therefore, we, we promote this idea of having access to clean sources of energy for, for cooking, for heating, for lighting it at home. If not, at least having an improved cook stove and ventilation. If you have to use wood or, or charcoal for cooking, at least make sure that you have an improved stove and you have good ventilation. And make sure as well that your children will not be so much exposed. The other complication of this issue of uh, using solid fuels is that you need to collect it. Mm -hmm. So the girls are the ones normally responsible for collecting this wood or the solid fuels, and then they will be exposed to violence and, and rape, and they, they are not going to school because they are spending hours collecting those uh, uh, fuels for, for cooking at home. So it's really sad. Uh, look at a map for me. Where is the problem the greatest? As expected, I mean, developing countries. You have uh, many countries in in Africa, in particular, where, uh, as you described it before, I mean, three billion people is still using a very rudimentary, very almost prehistoric, uh, stone age ways of of, of cooking. And uh, so Africa is one of the most affected, but as well, Southeast Asia, you have uh, places as well in Latin America where they are still using these uh, solid fuels for cooking at home. So we need to change that. Clean energy sources, what types of things are we talking about? What types of options are out there and how available are they? Well, you know, it will be electricity, for instance, as we, we have in many other industri more industrialized countries, but it could be something else. It could be LPG, for instance, liquefied petroleum gas. Mm -hmm. It could be, even if it's not feasible, at least, as I was saying, improve cook stoves and better ventilation at home. That will already contribute to the reduce the level of pollution indoor and at least the reducing the risk for some of those terrible diseases that we were saying before. Thank you, Maria. I'm going to ask you Thank to stay you. with me a bit longer. I'm going to shift gears to Solomon here for just a second. Uh, Solomon, you work for the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Tell me a little, little bit about your organization's role in the public health sector there. Thank you very much. Just before I get to what my colleague was talking about, indoor pollution, uh, I just want to speak a little bit about my own organization. This is an organization that was established some 35 years ago. Uh, it has the mandate of carrying out research on uh, human health. Uh, we have tried to consolidate our research programs into about six areas so that we can manage uh, all the research that there is for us to do. Uh, we have programs on infectious and parasitic diseases, uh, which deal with things like malaria, TB, HIV, and so on. Uh, then we have programs on biotechnology, uh, which introduces us to new technologies that are available in health research. Then we have uh, programs on um, non-communicable diseases. That is a big area right now with the increase in cancers, uh, with increase in lifestyle diseases. Uh, that's a major problem 
uh, in developing countries right now. Then we have a program on traditional medicine uh, that is a very critical component of uh, uh, health delivery. Uh, so we have an entire center that is dedicated to traditional medicine. We have a program on sexual and reproductive health, uh, taking care of uh, issues to do with reproductive health. Uh, we also have a program uh, basically that looks at public health uh, and health systems. So in all, we have uh, uh, six broad programs. Now, what is our role in public health? Uh, any, uh, any, any disease, really, that affects uh, human beings is a matter of public health concern. Uh, we have done significant research uh, over the years, and uh, we are beginning to see uh, very positive uh, indicators uh, uh, from the work that we are doing. In the area of HIV AIDS, for example, at one time, uh, the HIV prevalence in our country was about 14%. Uh, that has now gone to about 5.6. Uh, we are carrying out research in malaria, uh, malaria vaccines, uh, w which are really very promising uh, at, at the moment, uh, up to a level of 50%. Uh, we have uh, developed products in traditional medicine, uh, which are, can actually be applied. Uh, we have also developed uh, solutions uh, in biotechnology. Uh, we have kits uh, that are very uh, relevant to the local situation. We have kits on HIV, uh, kits on uh, hepatitis. Uh, we have also done a lot in public health. In fact, uh, we do assist uh, our own government uh, whenever there is a national survey to be conducted, be it for HIV AIDS, uh, be it for nutrition and so on. So we have contributed to all those issues, uh, noting that, that by doing so, we are actually contributing to a reduction of uh, the disease burden uh, in our country. Well, Solomon, it's unfortunate that I met you the last day of our broadcast uh, because I think you could have served on every one of our panels this That's week. Right. But That's since right. I've got you on this one, I'm going to go a little bit deeper on one particular topic. Uh, and that is, how do you plan to work on measuring the benefits of adopting clean fuel technologies? Um, as my colleague has said, uh, the issue of clean uh, uh, technologies, mm -hmm. energy technologies, really has to do with uh, indoor pollution. And uh, we have actually been carrying out work uh, in that particular area uh, because we do know that uh, polluted air within our households uh, is the main contributor of uh, upper uh, tract respiratory uh, infections. Uh, we did carry out some work uh, in one of the largest slums uh, in, in Africa uh, called uh, Kibera, and uh, we carried out work actually looking at the children who are in those uh, households. And uh, the findings were really uh, shocking because uh, quite a large number of them um, uh, suffer from upper uh, tract respiratory uh, diseases. These are caused by uh, poor air quality uh, within the households. So what we shall continue to do ourselves uh, is to continue to do research, uh, for example, to evaluate uh, clean energies uh, that are implemented within the, those setups so that we can measure uh, what is it before and after uh, introduction of uh, whatever clean uh, energy system that is going to be proposed, be it electricity, uh, if it is going to be available, be it simple technologies like uh, stoves, uh, and so on, whatever it is that is going to reduce uh, indoor pollution, then we should be able to carry out research to actually measure uh, how uh, successful that particular intervention is. So as a research institute, we have a big role uh, to play in that. Uh, a massive role indeed. Uh, I want to thank you for the research you're doing, and I look forward to, to reading some of your findings uh, in the coming months and years. Thank, thank you, you very much for coming by, thank Solomon. And next much. year we'll get you on the front end, and you can be on every panel thank with me. Okay, thank terrific. You very much. Thank you. Maria, I'm going to keep you. Uh, moderator's uh, privileges here, I guess, uh, because one of the things that we're doing here today is we're talking about the big issues that are going on during the Health Assembly. But since it's Friday in our last broadcast, we're actually looking ahead at some of the big health trends, especially over the next. 12 months. Uh, one of the things that is going to be coming up that will be quite important uh, with several big events uh, in the next few months is climate and health. And this area of work also falls underneath you at WHO, so I'd like to uh, go a little bit into this if you don't mind. Uh, first off, for our viewers, can you make the link for uh, the issues around climate and health? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, for those of you who were participating in the assembly, you will realize that all the ministers on their opening speeches, they mm -hmm. have been referring to the importance of climate change on our health. Why is this so important? Well, as you can imagine, climate is affecting most of the most important determinants of our health. Means access to clean water, sanitation, access to clean air, access to shelter, and access to food. If you have flooding or if you have a, a drought caused by this global warming, obviously this will be affecting our health and it will cause injuries, uh, migration, forced migration, it will reduce access to food and, and, and agricultural production. But in addition to that, there is another way that climate change can affect our health and is the way of changing temperature, for instance, that will facilitate maybe the life of these horrible mosquitoes that are transmitting diseases like malaria or dengue. We have seen places in Africa, for instance, where because it was very high and the temperature was relatively cold, we didn't see this transmission or they were not the perfect conditions for those mosquitoes to, to reproduce. But now we see cases of malaria in very high areas uh, in, in, in Kenya, for, inst for instance, and we see an increased risk of dengue in other regions mm. in Asia where we didn't see it before. So global warming is affecting not only the fundamental pillars of our health, but as well is causing this change of temperature will change in the way we will be, uh, uh, the, the certain infectious diseases will be mm, transmitted. In addition to that, obviously those uh, gases emissions, greenhouse gases emissions, will be affecting our respiratory system and obviously we will have chronic respiratory diseases and many others associated with air pollution caused by the same reasons as the uh, climate change. And over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, our viewers are going to start hearing more and more about this and see some significant uh, information come out. Can you just give me the milestones over the next 12 to 18 months and where they might be hearing more about this? Very exciting and very busy as well, mm -hmm. but I think it's a great opportunity for the health community. First, we are having end of August a big conference here in WHO in Geneva about climate change and health, where we want to bring the, the, the health systems and the health experts with the sustainable development community to see what are the opportunities, not only the risks, but as well the opportunities. As you know, if you reduce greenhouse gases emissions, so if you take measures to reduce climate change causes, at the same time, you can benefit a lot your health. You can reduce air pollution, mm -hmm. and by doing so, you can reduce the seven million premature deaths that are associated or attributable to air pollution, for instance. The other big event will be in September. The Secretary General of the UN is, is calling for a special high-level summit on uh, climate change, and we hope that this as well, where he wants to bring solutions, positive uh, action, and I hope we will be able to contribute from the health sector. As you know, health is always a very stimulating and a strong driving force, so we hope that by uh, contributing with those health arguments on how climate change mitigation policies can benefit a lot the health if, if we do, do it properly, I think it will be very good. Then we will have Peru, uh, in December, where Peru will be hosting the COP20, means that the, the negotiating uh, frame where countries will be discussing about the, 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 the post-Kyoto protocol, and then Paris, end of next year, December next year, where they are supposed to reach an agreement on the COP21 in Paris, and then starting the post-2015 big agenda on sustainable development, hopefully with an agreement. It is going to be such a busy year and a half for you. It is. Let me go back to my work then. Yes, I think I will. I think I will. But before I let you slide off that chair, uh, one last question. Uh, you recently just released a report on air pollution. Some of the indoor air pollution stuff we talked about first was in there, but also external air pollution. And it's something that's so real for a lot of people right now. Uh, can you just hit on some of the findings of that report? Terrible findings. Yeah. Not that it was a surprise, but still having the figures on your table with such a good methodology apply and telling you that more than 7 million premature deaths can be attributed to exposure to indoor and outdoor air pollution, I think is a, is a very strong message. It's now the biggest environmental risk for health that we have, and therefore one of the biggest public health challenges that we need to face. If we want to do something about air pollution, we need to work with all sectors, and this is affecting not only 
developed countries, but developing countries, both, everybody's at risk because we all need to breathe. That's clear, and the quality of the air we breathe is fundamental for our health, and I think people make very easily the connection of air pollution affecting my health. Normally, people make the connection with respiratory diseases, mm -hmm. but in fact, we all know now that the scientific community knows now very well that it's not just the respiratory diseases, it's about cardiovascular diseases as well. And in fact, 80% of the diseases that are uh, causing uh, mortality due to exposure to air pollution are cardiovascular, means ischemic heart disease or a stroke. And then the rest are uh, stroke chronic pulmonary diseases, asthma, pneumonia, lung cancer, all of those diseases that people know very well. So in fact, this is a major, major public health issue that we are confronting and we count that in association or linking and joining our forces with the climate change community, we will be able to transform this on an opportunity to tackle the causes of climate change and by doing so, responding to one of the, some of the challenges caused by air pollution. Maria, thank you so much for letting thank me you. keep you a little bit longer. My uh, I recognize that I just turned that into the Dr. Maria Nera block, uh, but so much of her work uh, just really touches on everybody's day-to-day -day life. Uh, and I think it's, it's very important uh, that this uh, gets addressed. And I think over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, like she said, you'll be hearing so much more of this uh, that you will really enjoy uh, seeing more of her and hearing her reports as they come out. Now, this might sound a little strange, but in the past uh, decade, I think one of the best tools in public health uh, might be changes in communications technology. One example of this is mobile phones and how we can use mobile phones to help people become healthier. Joining me now to talk about how mobile phones are working to improve health, Ambassador Sylvia Pohl, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of Costa Rica to the UN office in Geneva, and Dr. Vinyak Prasad from the Prevention of Non-Communicable Diseases uh, at WHO. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Vinyak, let me just start with you for a moment. Can you just take a moment and explain to me the Be Healthy, Be Mobile initiative? Okay, thank you very much. Um, this initiative is a joint WHO and ITU initiative which we launched in response to the UN General Assembly resolution on NCDs in 2011. So we launched this in 2012 and uh, the idea is to work at the country level. And the first country that we've uh, engaged in this initiative was Costa Rica. Perfect. Let's start over there with you then, Ambassador Paul. Why was Costa Rica interested in getting involved in this? We were very interested uh, for several reasons. First of all, the, the NCD issue is, is very important for us, the control and prevention of NCDs. And in our case, we had just passed a very strong law on, uh, related to tobacco. And we wanted to put this law also into, into effect. And um, being from a small mission, I, I oversee issues both in ITU and both in WHO. So I knew the both, both sides. For me, it was really good to, when, when this partnership came up. And when they mentioned the opportunity, we grabbed it. And we thought this was a very good. We have also our, our in the case of Costa Rica, we opened up very recently the, the telecommunications market. So the, the, the growth in, in the use of mobile phones and also especially in, in mobile phones like the, the, the more specialized ones was v going very well. So it was a an excellent opportunity to, to see how we could put into place this um, initiative. You touched on it right there. Elaborate for just a little bit more for me, if you would. Uh, what makes Costa Rica so suitable for this? Uh, well, it makes, there were a lot of factors that, 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 that I think uh, made it a success to, to, and to, to be able to, to put it into place. First of all, we had a very strong political will in the case of the Minister of Health. Once the, the, the project was proposed to her, it was one of the issues she wanted to attack, the issue of, of tobacco cessation and, and the issue of prevention and control of NCDs. And this was a tool to use, and, and so it was perfect, and she was immediately on board. And then uh, I think there was a very excellent teamwork, and I would like to publicly thank WHO and the whole team, and also the ITU team, because we really worked really well between the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the mission here in, 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 in Geneva, and WHO and ITU. We were a really big team, and we really worked really well 
to try to implement this. So I think uh, the political will and also the interest. And uh, we also knew that we had to put some efforts in and we also put some resources besides the resources we got from ITU and WHO. Tell me about the progress so far. What's been accomplished? Which technologies have worked the best? Well, so far it's it's gone really well. We've had quite a few people being part of the program and also quite a few success stories. And, and this was also recently presented in a big conference on development uh, by, organized by ITU uh, only a few weeks ago because both organizations are seeing how, how in the case of ITU, technology is the vehicle and yeah. WHO gives the technical support on how uh, how to use and what the messages should be. And, and one important thing was to adapt the messages to the reality of the country. And that was very important for us. And also the communication, very important, the communication of the program. We used, for example, two very important, the most famous football uh, teams to mm -hmm. help us promote the initiative in a very simple way so that everyday people could, could, could understand it and participate. So, so far it's going great. Terrific, thank you much, and good luck with that project, Fenyuak. Let me come back to you for just a minute to talk a little bit more about the, the bigger picture of it. Uh, what prompted uh, WHO to launch this initiative in partnership with ITU? Uh, most critical is that NCDs go beyond the health sector, and IT and telecommunication have come to become a key social determinant. And ITU is the lead UN agency for telecom and technology, and also they also have the ability to partner with the private sector, with different stakeholders. So we use that opportunity to create a wider stakeholder uh, forum to help us achieve our objectives. What makes mobile and other information and communication technology so ideal for this? A number of things. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, we've seen mobile phones reach out to uh, to millions, for example, I'll give examples from Africa. It, it almost reaching 70 to 80 percent population now having mobile phones, and they trust it. Mobile banking and things like that. There's a trust issue. There's an access issue, mm -hmm. affordability issue. So the health sector can leverage all of this to make available certain services um, in conjunction with the other re regular facilities for health delivery. So it is something which is very synergistic. All right, what is the goal of this initiative? Go back to the big picture for me. What is the goal of the Be Healthy, Be Mobile initiative? And update me on the progress so far. So this initiative is not about doing pilot. It's all about country ownership, doing national level programs. So we are different in that sense. It's all about using the science, the evidence base. Mobile cessation has been working very well. We can get every youth to quit uh, if we target them. We can reach out to uh, those who are diabetics, diagnose them, and uh, follow up on them. We can do cervical cancer screening. We can help uh, alcoholics quit. We can imp improve our levels of uh, stress management. It's all about wellness. So all of these exist as tools, and they're they are all evolving continuously. And that's how we are seeing. These are all applications which we are now um, testing. The first one is Costa Rica Association. The second is uh, Senegal on diabetes later in the year. Zambia, the first lady was here, and she mentioned cervical cancer, and that's where we are launching the, uh, the first mobile cervical cancer intervention in Zambia. UK and Norway, two developed countries, have joined this initiative, which is also very something very unique for WHO, is that developed countries would want to see what global progress is happening and share mm -hmm. their lessons. So it's a mutual exchange, a mutual benefit. And so by the end of, uh, let's say, 2016, the idea is to reach out to about eight, nine countries and have a set of tools, a standard operating procedure, for uh, a, a number of interventions on NCD. And we hope we'll be able to help achieve the overall objective of reducing NCD deaths. All right, look into the crystal ball for me. Uh, looking down the road, uh, what are the future uh, technologies, the future innovative technologies uh, that might be uh, used for something like this? We keep guessing, yeah. but <laughs> yes, the, the ones which are most recently, if you've seen the wearable devices, uh, which are uh, like contact lenses, which are reading uh, some of the, our health parameters or uh, s s watches which can measure our blood pressure and things like that. 
it's, it's, it's evolving, and I, I, I can only make a guess that some of these wearable devices would end up being something which is very normal for uh, all of us to start looking at and using and taking care of our health needs. That would itself would be a great achievement because it is a health burden because if I can take care of our, my own health in some ways, that would be a big achievement. Well, this is our interactive platform here. and Whenever a yellow card is passed to me, it means our viewers have questions, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, now I'll let either one of you answer this. Uh, not everyone has access to data networks. How much is being done through text messaging? <coughs> Perhaps you both touch on that. We can both touch on mm -hmm. this. Uh, the, the tools which you have started to use now, for example, Mobile Tobacco Association and the one on diabetes, also on cervical cancer, largely based on SMS-based uh, okay. services. And uh, in many countries, uh, we are now seeking to negotiate with the, the, because the governments are working on this, to negotiate the bulk SMS rate so that the delivery cost is also lower. Ambassador Paul? Exactly, I, I wanted to add that. In the case of Costa Rica, mo mostly the, the messages are being sent by SMS. So, so you don't have to have the most sophisticated phone. Uh, and and b as he, I just wanted to add, in the case of, of, of how many people have mobile phones, based on ITU, there's already over 7 billion wow. mobile phones. Wow. So it's more mobile phones than people. Mm. But on the other hand, there's also still what they call the digital divide. There's still enough people who don't have the access. And that's also uh, something that ITU is working on. And they understand that, that, that ICTs, broadband, the use of mobile phones are tools for development. And they are wonder, wonderful tools, and Costa Rica has understood that also and want to use it. And this will be our, for us also like a pilot program. So the tobacco cessation will be the first issue. We want to then use the platform for other problems. We also have cervical cancer, and we have other NCDs issues. So th this will be just the first step of hopefully many, many more projects related to mobile phones. Really just such a great initiative using uh, the technology that's most important to us all, I think, on a regular basis to improve our health. Thank you both. We look forward to continuing to hear progress updates. We'll invite you back next year for the show. Thank uh, you. And you can tell us all about the countries. So thank you both very much. I appreciate it. All right. As this is the end of the World Health uh, Assembly coverage of World Health Plus Social Good, we wanted to tie everything up for you. We've spent a lot of time talking about the resolutions uh, that are coming forward uh, this year at the Assembly, talking about major health issues down the road. But we wanted to explain that it doesn't end here. Uh, this is really, in, in many ways, the beginning. Uh, because what is taken here is, is basically policy that looks at the global picture. But that's not the way we live. Uh, we live in communities, we live in cultures, we live in regions, we live in countries. Uh, and what fits the picture at a global level may not necessarily uh, translate into a local level. And so in our effort to explain how what's done here translates to your life on a regular basis, I've brought in one of our regional directors, Dr. Carissa Etienne. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank she you. oversees all of WHO's work in all of the countries that are in the Americas region. How many countries do you have in that region? 38 member states. There we go. More countries than that. Wow, goodness gracious. Uh, it, thank you for joining us, Carissa. I appreciate it. Uh, so tomorrow, the World Health Assembly comes to an end. And if everything goes according to plan, we should have nearly uh, 20 resolutions and decisions taken. Uh, which of the issues discussed would you say most impact your region? Many of them. <laughs> Can <laughs> talk about that? If, if, you, if you consider that um, uh, many of the resolutions uh, and agenda items began with our member states and were put on the, on the agenda by our member states, so you, uh, tremendous implications. I think also the um, resolution on universal health coverage uh, is going to be of importance to our member states. Our member states have uh, identified this as a priority and we are in the process at PAHO of defining a strategic um, plan of action to address the universal health coverage. So the discussions that were held here will have um, in significance for, um, for our region. Disabilities, um, disabilities, um, this agenda item was introduced by um, Ecuador and um, the, in 2013, the World Health Assembly took the decision to um, 
develop a plan of action. And the region of the Americas also said that simultaneously we will do that plan of action. And so the resolution at World Health Assembly will come to, um, to PAHO and also will inform our own um, plan of action on disabilities. Okay, walk me through that process. How does the work that's done here move to the regional level for implementation? So, for instance, um, the NCD indicators, we, we, um, we had a resolution and agreement on NCD indicators going forward. Those indicators will be taken by the regional level. Um, we will examine our instruments, our strategic and plan of action, and include those in there but at the same time work with member states to ensure that we develop the mechanisms, we put into, into place the processes with member states to allow us to be able to monitor those indicators and to repat, report back up the chain to, to the regional level and to, and to the global level. So it's not always that um, decisions and resolutions at World Health Assembly passes through the filter of the regional level because some, some of them have direct implications for countries and countries have acceded to those resolutions so they also have a responsibility as well and, and particularly as this relates to some of the priorities in the strategic plan because you will realize that the GPW, um, the Global Plan of Action of Work for, for WHO, both country and secretary have a responsibility for the outcomes no? and the impact. No? A lot of these resolutions, they, as they lay out the issue, they have actions for WHO, actions for countries. Does everything that is done here have to uh, be taken forward? And if not, uh, what is chosen at the region and country and or country? So le let me just explain the process. Thank so um, these resolutions that have been taken here this month in May, in June, we have the Executive Committee meeting of PAHO. So those will be looked at in the Executive Committee of PAHO, and the decision will be taken there. Do we have resolutions that are, are similar? What are the resolutions that we need to work on? Which, which of those resolutions do we need to develop a plan of action? But also, what are some of the actions that member states themselves can take? So, so we, 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 we do that. The importance is that um, when these global decisions and resolutions come to the region and to the countries, the specificities um, need to be considered. The specificities of the country, the specificities of the region um, also help us to nuance this, um, this resolution and make it more relevant for the region and the country. Who's responsible for making all this happen? I see the process, <laughs> but it? how does it actually what does WHO do to help the countries along? Uh, what are the individual uh, players doing? How does the this regional director mm -hmm. has a tremendous responsibility uh -huh. to, to ensure that we work with member states. One, to ensure that the decisions coming out of the, um, the World Health Assembly are looked at by our governing bodies and that the, the, um, the examination of those resolutions and the assessments are done as to the relevance for, for the region. But remember that in our, our member states, we also have country offices. And, and our PWRs, or, or what we call the WRs, the WHO PAHO representatives, then have the responsibility to work with member states. And we also provide technical cooperation, either from the, our national offices, our country offices, or if not regional offices, or we are supported by um, the global level as well. So it is, it is really all of WHO working um, to influence health across the globe, and, but ensuring that it also has the specificity and relevance that impacts the lives of people where they are in their communities and in their, in their countries. So uh, this is really the mark of a start of a lot of work yes, uh, it is. for you yes, and tremendous. all of the member states that yes, you have. Yes, yes, definitely. Dr. Etienne, thank you so much for thank coming by. I know this is an incredibly busy week for you and I'm thrilled that we uh, were able to get you for just a few minutes to uh, explain this to our viewers. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so Thanks. much. All right. Now, although the assembly continues one more day, uh, we have a lot of work left still. Uh, this is going to be the last broadcast of World Health Plus Social Good. 
Uh, we're going to let all of our friends at the UN Foundation go home for the weekend while we continue to work. I hope it's been as useful and as fun for you as it's been for us. We've certainly uh, enjoyed ourselves. It's the first time we've tried this. Uh, and next year, uh, if you follow the actions of the Assembly this year, you'll recognize that we have agreed to webcast the entire World Health Assembly for the first time. So if you want to see more of the nuance uh, than you did this year, you'll get to watch everything next year. But with a little luck, we'll get to try this again. Uh, and we hope that if we do, uh, you'll join us as well. In the meantime, stay active, stay healthy, and we hope to see you next year.